Uh, call the meeting to order. I heard the announcement that the meeting is being recorded. I'll now read the standard opening statement. This is the Northampton Conservation Commission for the 25th of April, 2024. The commission is a group of unpaid volunteers who work to protect the natural environment of Northampton. We are concerned with the eight interests defined in the Massachusetts Wetlands Protection Act, and our duties also include open space acquisition and management. We operate in a way that's consistent with open meeting law requirements. All meeting dates, times, and agendas are posted in advance, and we invite public comment during our meetings. However, we ask the public to limit their comments to issues that are within our purview. Uh, today's agenda includes uh, a uh, request for determination of applicability to determine if drinking water well installation within the riverfront area is subject to the Wetlands Protection Act or the City Wetlands Ordinance. Uh, this on Turkey Hill Road. And uh, then I noticed that uh, somebody has a mic still on. Um, uh, and then a notice of intent for construction of three single family homes within the buffer zone on Landy Avenue. Uh, let's see. I don't think we had any minutes this meeting, Sarah, or did we? Uh, we did. I did send out one set. Uh, let me go back and take a look. Uh, October 12th. And hmm, what day did you send those out so I can track it down? I probably read it when it came, but I'm just not remembering it right now. I think it was yesterday. I'm seeing it. Yeah. With the staff report. Yeah. Oh, with the staff report. Okay. Hang on just a sec. Uh, and Kevin, before you do the minutes, also there's general public comment, if there is any. Do it in that order? Okay, first, uh, I'm, I'm scanning the minutes though. Hang on, let me just do that. Good. All right. So uh, then back to uh, the proper order of meeting. Um, is there any public comment not having to do with the case before us this evening? Yes. May I speak? Sure. Please. <laughs> I, I, I didn't know if you could hear me. I just have the. Well, oh, you just muted yourself. That was my error. I'm sorry, Jenny. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. I uh, got my video back. Um, this week, just for the benefit of other members of the commission, I've been in email conversation this week with, with Sarah and with Kevin, and I made three requests. I requested an opportunity to screen share a map when I speak at a hearing, and I was denied that. I also asked for... Um, someone on staff or on the board to put up a map for me when I make my comment. I received no answer. And I also asked what was the time limit for speaking at the hearing. And again, I got no answer. I have a comment. It pushes four minutes. I hope I will be permitted to finish. Thank you. That's what right. we're here. Good. When we get to that case, uh, you will have your opportunity. Any other comments? If not, um, then we have a, um, a set of minutes from October 12th. I just read through and they looked okay with me. Somebody want to make a motion to approve those minutes? Almost. 
Mm -hmm. a second? Second. Um, and any modifications or amendments to those meetings, those minutes? If not, uh, all in favor, uh, uh, Sarah, roll call. Roll call vote, uh, since we're remote. Beth? Yes. David? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. All right, unanimous, thank you. All right, so we have a request from the applicant for the uh, first item. Um, to continue to a future time. So this is the uh, uh, determination of applicability to determine if drinking water well installation within the riverfront area is subject to the Wetlands Act or the Wetlands Ordinance, um, this on Turkey Hill Road. Uh, Sarah, did the applicant request any particular date for that or just to delay it for now, to continue it for now? Uh, that would be May 9th at, at 5.30 and it, it may be withdrawn between now and then. I see, okay. Um, so, uh, can I get a motion to continue that first item until May 9th, first item up, 530? I'll make that motion. Yeah. Beth made motion, David second. Any further discussion or comment? If not, all in favor, roll call, Sarah. Beth? Yes. David? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Now, open lead meeting law requires us to wait till it's fully 540 to move on to the next case. So uh, um, I thought I would give a brief and Mason and David were both there um, so they can comment on this as well. But the uh, annual workshop at Smith College about sediment removal from Paradise Pond uh, was um, yesterday. And it was actually, I have to say, more interesting than I had anticipated. Um, and um, they seem to be at a point where they now know how. They have, in years past, they used to bring in heavy equipment and dig six, eight feet deep uh, the whole pond. Um, and now what they're doing is maintaining a goal of a two foot depth with deeper channels um, and uh, allowing the channels and the movement in those channels to uh, transport the sediment downstream a little at a time instead of having to bring in heavy equipment to take it all out at once every several years. And they've gotten to the point now where they're taking, I think it was 8,000 yards uh, uh, this last winter season. Um, and uh, although there's some complaint about that it doesn't look very pretty when it's drawn down to allow the uh, flow to carry the, the sediment downstream. It seems to be uh, quite successful. At the same time, uh, Bob Newton and uh, Professor at Smith and the uh, uh, responsibility for Smith is primarily focused on maintaining the integrity of the pond. Um, and so there was also a uh, muscle, M-U-S-S-E-L, -S a biologist speaking, who gets down below the dam and tracks down mussels um, at four different, I guess, five different sites um, between there and um, just above where it enters the uh, um, Oxbow area by uh, Arcadia. Um, and his uh, assessment was that there is a, a population of mussels. Um, he finds them and puts little tags with super glue so he can know which ones he found before um, and has little numbers on them. And they uh, uh, seem to be a surviving population, but not a reproducing population. Um, the, um, the, there are no babies. They're just the same old mussels. Mus mussels apparently live for many decades and uh, they keep finding the same ones. Uh, this, it turns out, which is something I didn't know, um, that mussels depend on fish um, for the reproduction process, that when the male and female mussels put their uh, respective fluids into the water and they there are uh, uh, the beginnings of, of, of mussel life in some kind of, I don't know, David, you may know what the proper term is for those little tiny things, but they're 
he described them, the muscle biologists described them as looking like Pac-Men. Um, they're little um, uh, things that like bite a larvae. Yeah, but I, I guess it's a larva or larvae. And they attach to the gills. Right, right, which I thought was fascinating. And so with, with the drop structure down at the, it's almost a small dam below um, uh, Route 10 and uh, uh, right under Route 10 on the one end and Smith Dam on the other end, there aren't a lot of fish in there. So that could be an explanation or it could be that the mussels are somewhat bothered by the sediment being transported down or that didn't seem to be burying them or uh, bothering them in any obvious way that the mussel biologist uh, could discern. Uh, so anyway, this, they seem like they've finally gotten, they're not, not going to return to the uh, bringing in heavy equipment. They're going to keep doing it this way. Uh, the, the trick was finding the right channel and then uh, making sure that uh, that channel was sustainable. And then they could bulldoze the excess sediment into the channel and it gets carried downstream in um, high flow events, anything over a thousand um, cubic feet per second. So it's a uh, periodically when they know a big render is coming, they're going to lower the dam a little bit and move the uh, sediment into the channel and have it be carried downstream. Uh, now, Mason, you stayed around. I had to leave, but you stayed around for the discussion of whether there might ever be a removal of that dam. Um, how did that part go? Because the dam has been well, there since the 1600s, interest. apparently 350 years. Yeah, um, very interesting. Um, and they, they pointed to the upper uh, Roberts Meadow dam removal. An example of kind of what will happen because the huge sediment layer up there that's eroding down as as the years go by, um, and they were they were looking at possible removal. Of course, there's it's about fifty fifty about who wants it removed and who wants it to stay. Aesthetically, the pond's nice, but basically the pond's a bump in the stream. It's not like a true pond. Right. The professor. No, no, con no conclusions. Was, well, yeah, he's he's taking Bob's place. He put out a, a, a survey to the class. What would happen, or what they think would happen, and whether they would be in favor of. Um, but uh, very, very, uh, very interesting. There's really no hard conclusions. It's, it's kind of a 50 50 toss up on whether they want to go ahead with it or not. That's what I was looking at the reasons why it would be to take it down and damage with the dam. And we had beautiful slides of the water roaring right over the top of the dam. Yeah, I imagine there would be a lot of unhappy alums coming back for reunions if uh, yeah. the pond weren't there one of those years. Mm -hmm. All right. Right. Well, now, any, David or Nathan, anything else you want to add about the Smith workshop? I was, yeah, it was interesting. And uh, you know, they didn't tell us how much the uh, current uh, approach was costing them, but the last time they did the dredging, I think they said it was something like $700,000. Uh, to do it, and they only removed about 12,000 um, cubic yards. And so now I presume this is a much more sustainable approach in terms of, you know, from fin financial point of view. Uh, but they didn't say. Yeah. Right. Well, I'll talk later on to... this. Hmm? Go ahead, Mason. We'll talk later on this, maybe after the hearing. Okay, very good. Yeah. Uh, Apparently, with the closing of Northampton's landfill, they don't have a good place to bring the sediment anymore, even if they were to try uh, the heavy equipment approach again. So, but anyways, mm -hmm. uh, it, it was a more interesting couple of hours than I had anticipated. And it's ironic. Uh, Bob was uh, instrumental in the closing of the landfill, too. Uh, Bob, yeah, Bob, Bob Newton. Yeah, because he, he spoke, uh, he, he uh, expressed quite a bit of concern about contamination of the aquifer. As a result of the landfill being there. Uh huh. Uh huh. Well, he's a, a good guy and a popular uh, faculty. He's emeritus now, but uh, 
a popular faculty member and he's stayed involved uh, even though he's officially retired. Um, all right, now we'll move on to a notice of intent for construction of three single family homes uh, within the buffer zone, uh, this on Landy Avenue. Um, and who's here to speak to that? Hello everyone, this is Ryan Nelson from Arlevec Associates representing New Way Homes. How's everyone doing? Hi. Um, is it possible to share my screen? Sure, I have to let Sarah give you permission. There it is. Okay. All right, so some of you may remember uh, this site. We had applied for an RDA a few years ago to demo the single family home that was on the property along with some outbuildings and some trees on the property. So that work has been done. Um, and now the applicant is looking to construct a new development here. Um, let me zoom in here. This is the property, 39 Landy Ave. There was an, there's an existing wetland off to the west here, a bordering vegetated wetland. Um, and then the former house, let me just switch to the previous plan and give you some context. Former house was located here. There was a garage located in the backyard in the back corner. And then there was a variety of gardens and sheds and overhangs um, were in this area within the 50 foot wetland buffer. Um, so that has all been removed, trees removed, the place has been grubbed, uh, erosion controls were in place, uh, no encroachments occurred outside that. Uh, limit of work that was authorized for that project. Um, so the applicants wishing to split this property into three parcels, lot one here, lot two, lot three. Here's the 35 foot buffer zone from the wetland that's off site. And then here's the 100 foot buffer zone. So as you can see, a portion of the houses are within the buffer zone. Um, we are proposing a planted uh, buffer zone enhancement area within the 35 foot buffer. That would be an improvement over the prior conditions where the garage was uh, in the back corner here within that 35 foot buffer. This was kind of a, a combination of maintained lawn and gardening and shed area in this corridor. So under this project, we're proposing to um, clean that area up uh, in addition to whatever is already, you know, demo and grubbing had occurred there. It would be planted, seeded, and left to revert to a, a natural forest setting. Um, and these plants in this area have been picked to be native, um, either you know wetland or upland facultative buffer zone species. Uh, the property is fairly flat. It ranges from elevation 222 to 224. It's uh, very gradual. So there's not a whole lot of site work that's occurring in terms of grading for this property. Um, the houses will be the high points, elevation about 224, and they'll slope uh, very subtly to this back uh, end of the property where this mitigation area is. You can see 224, uh, it was kind of a break line that would slope towards the street. There's a low point in between the units, um, but the majority of the site is sloping towards the back uh, around that mitigation area, which is about 223 and a half or 223.75, depending on uh, where the existing spot shots are. So um, there are going to be garages proposed for each, each of these lots for vehicle storage. Obviously there'll be a deck at the rear of the homes, um, sidewalks connecting out front, uh, anti-tracking pad, prevent sediment from coming out into the roadway. Although I, I don't believe there's any stormwater subsurface uh, catch basins within the roadway to be worried about. Um, everything will be seeded and loamed as soon as final grades are achieved. Uh, silt fence is proposed on the downgrading limit of work. Um, aside from that, I think that hits on all, all the key items. Happy to answer any questions the commission may have, but just want to reiterate that there was an existing single family home on this property, Mo majority of the property being maintained. And we're just looking to uh, be consistent with that existing use and just a kind of a repurpose of the property. 35 foot buffer, is this because that's an infill project? Uh, 
believe it's because it's within the urban residence B zone and it's a redevelopment okay. project. Other questions, comments from commissioners? The the application mentioned um, adding some dry wells. Where would those be located? I couldn't find them on the plan. Sure. So our original submission um, had in, included those in the backyards within low points. Um, but we cross-referenced that with the test pit data. Um, and there wasn't enough clearance between the bottom of the dry wells, even though there's precast shallow dry wells. Um, so we omitted those due to relatively shallow groundwater on the property. And instead, uh, this rear backyard area is pitched towards uh, this mitigation area in the existing wetlands. I see. And so currently the grading would be, would, I mean, how much do you have to change the existing grading to get that pitch towards the, towards the back of the property? Uh, you're do we're showing a cut fill within one foot. So like this existing 224 contour runs along the site. Um, you can see we're just shifting that 224 contour. Here's the 223, this line right here. Um, so very minimal, within a foot or two at the most. Got it, okay. The, the, the lowest point uh, is that space between the buildings at 223. Correct, right here. Yep. And um, that will just presumably percolate down. Into the... Correct, yes. Okay. And there there will be, like, if, if we were to get a significant rain event, um, this low point continues between this 224 contour to the back. So it's not like it would flood the houses or the front yard. Mm -hmm. It does have an escape. Um, if it gets above 223 contour. It's all between 223 and 224. That's great. Yeah. Okay. Full basement or slab? Uh, um, what are the plans for construction? I believe it's going to be slab due to groundwater, but if that's different, uh, John may be on the line. He may be able to correct me. No, I think we plan on going with full basement. Okay. Basement with some pumps, yes, sir. Uh, I didn't see anywhere what the prior uh, impervious surface was compared to the proposed impervious surface. Sure, so I looked at the uh tax rest records, the assessor records for this house, it gave a living area of 1700 square feet. I don't know if that includes the second floor. Um, but with the garage, and there was a shed over here that was unaccounted for, it's probably somewhere around 2,000 square feet in total, um, not including the driveway. And our each unit is going to be 900, there's three of them, so that's 2,700 plus another 900, 1,000. So you're looking at 3,700 total for buildings. Um, I'm not sure what the driveways are, but it's probably another, probably double that. So maybe 7,000 square feet in total with the driveways, 8,000 with porches. And the uh, driveways are proposed to be uh, asphalt or uh, pavers or what, uh, what material? Uh, John, do you have an anticipated? Yes, uh, uh, asphalt. Did you consider other locations for the garages? Because if they were further forward, I think Sarah pointed out in the staff report, there would be more room for the native plantings in the rear. Well, generally the city and myself also, uh, let me speak for myself, prefer to have the driveways uh, in the rear. So it's not so much in the front of the house. Uh, it just looks more like the older houses did back in the days.
it it uh, it looked to me that uh, you were pushing the garages to the point where they touched uh, the thirty five foot line, and um, I think my assessment is, and I'm not as uh, sophisticated as some of the other people on the commission who are professionals in this area, but that uh, there's nothing magic about the 35 foot, that that's really a minimum, um, not a magic line beyond which anything goes. Um, and so I'd be more inclined uh, to see the garages moved toward the street by 10 or 15 feet, reduce the amount of paved surface and have the protected area um, with native plantings um, and uh, be be larger, be beyond the the thirty five foot buffer. Are there reasons why that would impose a hardship on uh, 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 on this project, or is that feasible? Uh, just on the one through to the north, we had so they could back out of the garage and be back behind the house, and then drive turn and drive out. So have the back down the whole driveway. Uh, that was the one one there. Uh, the other ones were just basically trying to make it so they could double, looks as though double in front of the garage for parking. Uh, if it meets the zoning, you know, if it, as long as it meets the zoning rules and regs, I don't think I would have a problem if, the, if that would make the, please the board. We, we have to conclude that this is an improvement. So um, looking for um, that which will um, represent a genuine improvement. Um, and so that would be one of the things that would be on my list is uh, to have uh, a, a bigger um, protected zone. Um, because what we normally do is for um, the, the area that you show as having now native plantings um, installed is we would generally have either bollards or, or boulders uh, demarcating that so that uh, uh, current or subsequent owners um, don't just push through and mow all the way back. Um, uh, the, the lawn is essentially in, in parlance also degraded. Um, so it, uh, uh, yes, it can be more permeable than pavement, but it's still not a natural um, uh, environment. And so the more we can have of a natural environment, the better it, uh, the project represents an improvement. So yes, uh, moving the, the uh, uh, garages toward the street to the extent possible and having another 10 or 15 feet of uh, protected zone um, would, in, in my thinking, we haven't discussed this yet as a commission, but uh, in my thinking would more clearly represent uh, an improvement. That that would also reduce the amount of impervious pavement too, right? Yes, by substantial amount could be. Yeah. Um. Other questions from commissioners. Let me ask in in the uh, planting plan. I see the uh, uh, caliper diameter of some of the proposed plantings uh, in in the uh, chart, uh, and you know down there. Um, that uh, how how it's hard for me to. Um, Visualize how uh, how dense, how how rich a planted area that'll be, um, you know, five years out uh, once the uh, right. So there's more we mature. have, I believe, a total of 15, 19, 19 plants um, within that thirty-five foot strip. Um, that's maybe you know. 100 feet long so um really only what's that 3500 square feet um, plus additional things would you know likely um, establish their pioneer species um, but 
don't know. I, I think, you know, the spacing between these plants is shown is about 10 feet or less on center. The, and currently it was, that area was lawn? Portions of it. There was gardens along the back, along the back uh, fence. And then there was a garage in the southwest. Right, okay. Right up and against so did, were there, are you worried about invasive species there? You know, what What are you thinking for that? Um, in my assessment of the woods behind it, I didn't see a whole lot of invasives, but um, I'm not, not ruling it out. It could very likely, uh, you know, occur as this area establishes on its own. Um, probably be a good practice to monitor that throughout the life of the, the project, or at least the first two or three years to weed those out if any pop up. I think that could be conditioned. Uh, Ryan, that was, that was my question as well. I noted that you had stilt grass listed in the um, the Welland report, which is something that we're growing concerned about in Northampton as it's starting to pop up everywhere. And there are some other invasive species scattered around on the site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's multiflora rose. It, it, um, it's, it's, it's kind of a mess. Um, and I think it would take some pretty rigorous cleaning um, of invasives uh, before it would make sense to uh, plant the uh, the native plants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think logistically that makes sense. We're open to that. Any other questions, comments from commissioners? I guess the thing that I'm just sort of trying to wrap my head around is like, it, it, it's seeming like a big increase in impervious surfaces. And I'm trying to just weigh that against like well, the disturbed area before and the lawn. Um, I guess that's my question as much as a comment. Uh, proposed impervious within the buffer zone is 4,858 approximately. Um, I don't have an exact number on what the previous was, but maybe half of that would be my guess. Okay. The anti-tracking uh, aprons are just for construction? Correct. And was there uh, consideration to, uh, I, I, I know there's a debate about whether pavers are a reliable way to maintain permeability, um, that uh, they can function well for a time and then they get filled in and it's just another impervious surface. But was there consideration given to using something other than asphalt for the driveways? Um, we've incorporated the, incorporated that into some projects, depending on the soils. Here, the soils were historically disturbed and relatively shallow groundwater, so um, they're not the, exactly the greatest draining. Uh, not that they're impermeable by any means, but um, I think in a you know northern climate with not so great soils, I wouldn't advocate for them. Um, that's my professional take. Mm -hmm. And uh, Ryan, did you have a snow storage location identified for any of these? Uh, not shown on the plan, but um, my guess is that, John, do you anticipate, I mean, obviously, future owner would dictate, but I don't know if people on this street are more apt to plow or they have snowblowers. Um, my guess a snowblower off to the side would probably be more feasible since there's not really a, a location to push them other than just kind of wind rowing it off to the left on this side but uh once again it depends on the amount of snow too there's ample room for a couple inches just to wind row it off to the side but i, I more than agree with that other questions or comments from commissioners these are uh, three single-family homes, right? 
Correct. Curiosity, single story, double story? Double story. Other questions from commissioners? Other comments from commissioners? Is there a I'm kind of view the wildland in my mind? It's kind of trapped between two streets. Large bordering vegetated wildland, or is this? Um, I believe that's the Northampton Animal Vet Clinic, I think. On the abutting property and it's a very flat topographic wise site um, and there's just a little little slight depression within this area and then there's a stormwater outfall located right here where the primary source of water uh, originates and it flows in this direction off site um, this was kind of more of just a I say like a backwater shallow groundwater area it doesn't have the majority of the the flow um but yes it's essentially a low-lying spot between a, a parking lot and a forested area amongst uh, a row of houses that continues off to the west all right commissioners i'm going to ask for uh public comment uh, uh but feel free to also speak up if you have additional questions or comments. So uh, public comment, please. I see uh, Jackie Balance with a hand up. Mm -hmm. Is there any chance we could put my map up on the screen? Not usually. The map that I sent by email? We've all, we've, we've, we've all seen it. Uh, oh, you what, have, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. It's very well. Um, Ryan called this, uh, referred to shallow groundwater on this property. And I think that is the main feature. Uh, shallow groundwater describes the whole street. I will read from our code section 350-10, subsection D part one, quote, certain areas 50 to 100 feet from wetlands may be suitable for temporary, limited, or permanent disturbance as appropriate when the applicant can, can demonstrate to the commission satisfaction that the proposed work activity or use will not affect wetland values, et cetera. I would suggest that this use very likely will affect the wetlands values, that the parcel is unsuitable for a buffer zone less than the state standard of a hundred feet. The previous use for this property was established in 1930 before there were wetlands protections. So um, that, that's not, the fact that they had a garage back in the wetland, the rules weren't in effect in 1930. I would submit that the work already done on this parcel has already affected the wetland area. The developer has removed 11 living Norway spruce with an average DBH of 19 inches that's about 95 years of growth per tree. And they were really good at sucking up storm water. The other trees that were cleared include the seven mature fruiting and flowering deciduous trees, plus a variety of uncounted shrubs. The removal of so much vegetation has already altered the ability of this land to mitigate storm water runoff as illustrated in the photos taken on the abutters properties last summer when there was standing water ankle deep. And even last week's rains left standing water in this neighborhood. Uh, photos have been submitted to the commission. Mr. Hanif, the owner of another Hansel house across the street at 36 Landy told me that his house has a 100 foot wetland setback because his property borders a Massachusetts DEP designated wetland, which requires a hundred foot setback. On the MACRIS map I sent, 
I showed all the wetland areas in this neighborhood. The parcel in question was marked with a red box at the top center. Across the street, it was the DP, DEP wetland that I told you about. And then the water that runs off from number 39, Landy, drains into that BVW wetland, which in turn runs into the Mill River, which as the crow flies is just 600 feet away. Mains Field, which is basically across the street, flooded so badly last year, it caused significant damage. The recreation area was closed in July and it's still not open. There is a flood plain just a few yards upstream from Mains Field. And if you go across, up, across Mains Field, across the river, there's a water protection district on the other side, just a few yards downstream. In terms of the effect on the wildlife here, oh, songbirds were killed, babies in a nest when the house was demolished. The parent birds cried frantically as they watched that machine with its big claw lift parts of the house and take them away. Many creatures lost their homes when the spruce trees were felled. Local deer lost the fruit trees that they once fed on. The city's sustainable historic preservation plan also includes Landy Avenue, all the odd numbers, 39 is an odd number, uh, as part of an area of, of historical interest because one of the abutting properties was a center of abolitionist activity in the 19th century. So this area we is- that, We ask I that have, the public keep their comments to issues one, that have to do with wetlands. Okay, one more sentence. I just urge the commission to require a 100 foot wetlands buffer zone on this property. Thank you for your comments. I, I would uh, remind people that the commission has not created the, either the St State Wetlands Act or the City Wetlands Ordinance, uh, which includes the provision for a 35 foot uh, uh, buffer zone outside of wetland. There are no wetlands on the property. There's only the buffer zone. Um, and so we have to follow uh, those rules. Um, uh, yeah. and, uh, and, and Kevin, if I could just add for regulatory clarity, the buffer zone in itself is not regulated by the Wetlands Protection Act. The, the buffer zone um, is regulated in order to protect adjacent resource areas, but there are, unlike you know, riverfront area, bank, bordering vegetated wetlands, there are no performance standards in the Wetlands Protection Act for buffer zone. Um, so the city ordinance goes above and beyond that. Which is why we're looking at the in, the the plantings and the additional no disturbance area. But there there is nothing either in state law or city ordinances that would be a, that would allow the commission to completely prevent development within the buffer zone. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, I'm not sure what the order was, but I see Joe M uh, with a hand up. Yes. Um... I have actually three quick questions. One of them actually got answered that they're a two-story house. Could, could you so state that, your name, please? Joan Mirabel. I'm on Landy Avenue. And uh, Thank you. I see that, you know, they said 900 feet, so I'm a 900 square foot. So I'm assuming that's per floor. So it's 1,800 square foot is the exact size of the house. My second question was, there's an existing fire hydrant adjacent to this property between the property and the road. And they did not see that on the plan. And the third question actually goes back to the wetlands because lot number one, which has a driveway that goes from the road all the way back and does have a little turnaround. My question is, where was the plans for where they're going to put the snow when the snow comes during the winter? Because they, on the other side of that fence is the neighbor's driveway. And I don't think they want the, you to empty their driveway into the neighbor's driveway. So if they're going to be plowing in the back, they're going to be plowing it into that 35-foot buffer zone, and that will affect the, the buffer zone. Thank you. So any comments from the builders or, that are here on the line? Yes. Uh, hey, Joe, this is Ryan. Um, I, can, I can speak to those. Uh, let me just pull up the plan again. <clears throat> 
Um, so your first comment regarding the square footage, uh, we were generally conversing in terms of land coverage, so not vertical living space. Um, okay. So typically when we show on the plan like 900 square feet, that's the footprint of the structure. So the foundation yeah. footprint. I had to build my house near wetlands on the Cape and I had to put the, the exact size. I had to count the second floor in. That's why I was just kind of questioning that, but that's okay. Northampton may not require it. Yep. And, and then uh, the... it's a uh, part of the open meeting law requirements is that uh, we avoid discussion between the applicant and members of the public. Try to address my apologies, everything. my first time we here. Try so... to, we try to address everything to the commission. And then uh, uh, the, in this case, the applicant has uh, offered some explanation. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll allow that. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, continue. It was a. I think you were going to answer the snow storage question. Yes. Uh, lot one. Yep. So there is a hydrant located on the plan right here in front of lot three. Uh, it's a kind of a faded icon because it's an existing condition the line type. But um, and then in terms of snow storage, um, I think lot one would probably be the the trickier of of the three. But there's certainly room here uh, to deposit snow if someone was to come in from the street side and plow, uh, they could get it to this area and then push it um, in this area. Um, in an urban area like Northampton, not uncommon that, you know, a skid steer could probably do this rather than just the plow truck, and they'd be able to maneuver the snow over into those vacant areas. But I would think it would be reasonable to have a condition that snow shall not be deposited within uh, the mitigation planting planting area, whatever we determine that to be with the revised plan. Right, that would be a normal uh, condition that we would require. Okay. Um, let's see. Next, I have uh, Celeste Palladino. Sure. Hi there. Um, I'm at 29 Landy Ave, so abutting lot number one. Um, I guess I just wanted to echo, you know, I had submitted some photos, just the reality that, you know, this past July with all the rain, um, the water levels in my backyard really reached, again, ankle level. Um, and I'm not sure if that's kind of that the previously uh, existing spruces were kind of sucking up a lot of that water, but just wanted to really echo that concern. Um, and a, a wonder that if the proposed calipers of the replacement trees in the buffer zone kind of come anywhere close to what was there previously. You know, I know I planted some trees on my side uh, and in the year and a half since I planted them, you know, they've barely budged and those are three or four foot. Other quick note would just be wondering if the driveway so close to the property line would kind of prevent, you know, any more tree plantings kind of on the the property line straddling that area. And those are my comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Diane Scott. Hello, my name is Diane Scott and I live at 44 Landy Avenue in Florence. And um, it's my belief that any and all decisions on this property at 39 Landy Avenue should be delayed until there's been an appropriate length of time, seven days for both the commission one of your commissioners was not referencing the correct thing. And the abutters have the time to review the current plans. There have been three versions since about March 24th and at least two versions before that. It does not seem to be best practice to offer opportunities for public comment when the public cannot be sure on what they are commenting. The most recent incarnation of plans for this property came to my attention on 424 and that was yesterday. They were posted on the city's Conscom site on 423. I know that they were available in other places, but these were not the plans that were on file at the CONSCOM site either when the abutters received registered letters about the work to be done in the wetlands buffer area, and neither were they the plans that were in place when the notice of this meeting was posted on the property. Assuming that this process will move on, I offer the following. The newest revised site plan for 39 Landy Avenue in Florence shows that the plans from our Levesque include three natural gas services, one to each of the buildings. I confirm today that there's a complete moratorium on new services in Massachusetts, and though the demolished house had natural gas, once it was demolished, no gas service to that property can be restored. I know that CONSCOM cannot speak to gas lines, 
it's not in your purview. But with such a glaring mistake, it makes it hard to trust that other issues with compliance will be adhered to. The plan from our Levesque shows planting in the buffer zone. Although 11 full-size adult trees were removed, causing noticeable and serious changes in the ability for neighbors to manage their increased water caused from the lack of vegetation to mitigate it, the plan states that four immature trees and 15 shrubs will be planted. And all of these plantings occur within the 35 foot buffer zone. As stewards of the, our city's wetlands, how will you ensure that the trees will not be fertilized or treated with insecticides too so close to the wetland? With only 40% of the property stated to be permeable ground, this problem will get worse. It's no secret that this area of the city struggles with water issues. You may all remember that Maine's field remains unusable because of extensive water damage. And as we experience more effects from climate change, I anticipate more problems, not fewer. There is a drainage pipe shown on the, uh, let me see what that would be, the southern end of the property. And it's a little tiny thing and it says drainage pipe, location of drainage pipe. That is actually where the extra water that collects on the property doesn't go out. There's no catch basin on Riverside Drive where this water flows to. Any excess water flows through a hundred year old red clay pipe that flows through that land across the street through my property, down behind my property, and into the wetland that's part of the Mass DEP wetland. So I, that drainage pipe that's shown, um, that doesn't end on that property, and it doesn't go into any property on the street. I anticipate that with the loss of permeable surfaces with this plan, that that is going to increase exponentially. And there's a lot of opportunities for failure between where it begins and where it ends at the end of my property. My concern also is that anything going into that wetland is going to be in my wetland behind my house. So I have grave concerns about that. In light of this, I cannot understand why the city would not institute the state standard of 100 foot buffer zone to such a fragile and important part of our ecosystem. And I understand that that's not a requirement from the state, but I believe that the city can in different circumstances choose to, because of mitigating circumstances, extend that buffer zone. Um, the existing house and the garage, it's often said, you know, it's, you cannot compare what was there to what is proposed there because that house, as Jackie said, was built in the 1930s. And when it was built, the land behind it that is, is now the wetland um, was farmland and there was no medical center and there was no paved surface and there was, there was all of the surface was permeable because it was farmland when that home was built. So it was the building of the medical center with the asphalt and everything else. And some of you may have heard us complain before, that's a real problem that still remains unsolved. Um, we're still dealing with water from that. The existing house had, in addition to the apple trees, it had two fully mature um, magnolia trees. It had a vegetable garden, it had many, many flower gardens. It had seven foot tall rhododendrons. It had a 20 foot tall um, wisteria vine that went across the back of the property. Uh, the garage, like I said, there was, you can't really compare about, it's okay to put a garage there now because there was a garage there when Tony and Franny lived there because Tony and Franny didn't put the garage up in a wet, in a wet land. Um, the sump pumps, will pump the water where? Into the wetland that's going to go into the clay pipe that's going to go into my backyard? Curious where those sump pumps are gonna deliver the water to. There is no um, over, there is no um, catch basin on our street that's designed to carry away overflow what rainwater runoff or anything else. It, it only delivers it to the wetland. The snow removal from house two I have real problems with. We don't have skid steers and bobcats and things that remove snow on our street. We use snow blowers or shovels. Um, one house gets plowed, I believe. And um, so in light of all of these issues that I've brought up, I urge you, our conservation commission to conserve and preserve our natural environmental gifts like the bordering vegetated wetland that sits at the back of 39 Landy Avenue. Once this is gone, there is no turning back and there is no replacing it. 
And so you're the only people that can um, help preserve that land. And so I hope you take that charge seriously and act in as strong a way as you can to make sure that that stays good. Thank you for hearing me. Thank you. Um, I see uh, Deborah, I don't see a last name. Hi, my name is Deborah Berkovitz. I live on Warner Street in Florence and I was formerly the owner of an abutting property. Um, I wanted to speak to, uh, you know, one of the things that happens when these projects uh, by uh, Mr. Hansel come before different boards is that they don't always have the experience of other ones. So um, this just is very familiar to me from work that was done on Warner Street, where I am, um, I will say, downstream of a similar project that was three houses uh, on a they were basically considered each as a as a separate house lot. It was the same thing. A house was torn down, three houses put up, same size. And what, what happened there was um, because it wasn't considered as a project um, and because also the city seems to not be considering climate change in these decisions, there was so much runoff. There's been so much degradation of the bank in front of the house. And another um, project of his down the street, there was a water mitigation system put in place, but um, by his own admission, there was no plan for what would happen with it once the um, homeowners bought it. And I would say there's something similar in terms of the, you know, snow shall not be deposited, that there isn't really a mechanism. Once the builder has gone, it's just up to um, individual homeowners. Um, I'll also say that the um, there's been this, for me, deeply upsetting legacy of cutting down mature trees and replacing them with with tiny saplings um, and leaving uh, black asphalt driveways all over the place where there was vegetation and mature trees that were able to absorb water. And so one of the things that's happened um, in my neighborhood uh, from, from the very similar uh, building uh, techniques is that there's a phenomenal amount of runoff that's occurring and the trees that were planted by Mr. Hansel are actually going to have to be cut down because they're so close to the houses. So it wasn't even done in a way that uh, they were just the small saplings put in, but then they don't, they're not going to be able to mature because they're, they're, they weren't planted in a way. Um, so I think there have been some promises that, that concern me given the track record at other projects. Um, that look exactly like this on paper. And then um, the last thing I'll just say about the pervious or impervious surface is that watching Mr. Hensel's projects in different neighborhoods and experiencing the heat from the asphalt and the water runoff, it seems to me that it would be um, in the best interest of the citizens of Northampton uh, moving forward with climate change to be really looking at the issue where there is the opportunity for a commission to make a decision to not allow for more black asphalt and impervious surfaces when we know that we are having more and more water, we're having more and more rain in Northampton, and we're having more and more flooding. And that neighborhood has already seen it, the budding properties has already seen it in the last year, and it's only going to get worse with this project. It already got worse once the trees were cut down. So the commission, I would just say, has the opportunity to also say something about the amount of impervious surface on here and to put some some restrictions on this project that really uh, lead to accountability down the road because that has not been present in Mr. Hensel's projects. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I see uh, Reese Epic. Hi everybody, uh, I'm Reese. Thank you for pronouncing my name right. That's tough when you see it spelled. Uh, I'm at 30 Landy Ave. Uh, along with my neighbors, I, I do have a couple questions, um, and I'm going to address it to the, the council. And I apologize, I'm I'm new to this, so let me know what I'm doing wrong. Uh, I did submit some, some questions ahead of time. What I want to have is um, in the proposal, there was some mention that the slope uh, of the proposal is going away and, and going into that wetland. And there was no mention about what the slope is on the actual Landy Ave Street or on the people, uh, you know, kind of going away uh, the other direction. So I guess if the wetland is west, then what's the slope going east, north, and south? Because water isn't just gonna go the way that somebody wants it to go. We have the topographical lines, uh... To, to, to look at that are presented to the commission uh, is your question, 
what happens off the site that's under consideration? Well, my, my question is the slope. So the, I think his name is Ryan, said that the slope uh, is higher at the point of where they want to build the houses than it is in the wetlands. And so the inference is that the water will run away. It will run towards the wetlands. And that leaves three directions out of scope. I don't know what that, you know, if, if the slope is different going the other directions, that may not be true. It it might be true. So that, that's my question is what are what is the slope on the other points, given that they've introduced the fact that it's on whatever that it was, west or east, is lower. So that's my question. Um, the second question is I'm a little confused about um, if we're just talking about the footprint of the houses, the garage and the driveways, right? We're not including the second floor. Then I think when you refer back to the property that used to be there to Franny's house, you can't include the second floor either. So I don't think there's a fair comparison about what the existing footprint was and what the proposal is. Um, and I would also say that, uh, you know, um, that existing footprint was intentionally removed. And so you can't really rely on what it was. Like if you're going to use the existing footprint, that's great. That's totally makes a lot of sense, but that was removed. So that footprint doesn't really exist anymore. Right. Um, so I would just ask that, that people consider that and they kind of look at the numbers. Um, I had requested what the percentage of um, the area of the lot uh, that is going to be paved or built on compared to the the entire amount I, I believe one of the commissioners has has asked that question and i would appreciate a follow-up in hearing what that number is when i asked the question uh it appeared that it was going to be roughly uh two and a half to three times uh, more impervious surface than had been there pre previously yeah, that and you know, and I I don't know if this is relevant, but the but the fact that I think as Diane mentioned, you had a ha a house and a garage and you know, but there was also a significant amount of gardens and trees already there. That's all been removed. That that's no longer there, right? Um, I don't know. Uh, so I guess I I want to clarify the total square feet is just the footprint, right? So it's a nine hundred square feet for the house and whatever number of hundred feet for the garage times three, is that, am I correct in that? Nope. Yes. Okay. And then I'm new to all this, so I hope you can uh, forgive me for this kind of dumb question, but what's the purpose of a hundred yard buffer? Like what, what what's the intent of that? Uh, you're thinking of the hundred foot uh, buffer? Yeah, well, like what's, what's the, why do we care? Why should we care about that number? Well, th this uh, this gets into a sort of philosophic question about is there a magic distance from a jurisdictional area that is okay. uh, where uh, human activity no longer matters, and it's okay. always a, 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 it's always a judgment call. Uh, but in this case, uh, City Council has uh, uh, said that in the zoning that's applicable to this. Uh, neighborhood uh, that the, uh, the buffer from a protected zone from from a wetland area uh, need only be thirty five feet, not four, not not a hundred feet. Okay, um, and then I guess my my last is really just a request. Um, uh, like like some of the other neighbors, I live on the other side of the street. And I do have a perimeter drain. I also have a sump pump and we also have a pipe going out in order to redirect water. But there's a significant amount of water in that other wetland area. And so I think there is some, I guess it's runoff or whatever um, that is gonna be created that I hope that, you know, it, it, it's not in the proposal, but I hope the, the impact to the entire neighborhood is considered. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um... Is there anyone who hasn't spoken? I see uh, two people who have spoken before, but uh, is there anyone else who wants to offer anything that hasn't yet spoken? Meg Robbins, I see. Thank you, and I'll be very brief. Um, and I don't live on Landy Avenue. I live on Aldrich in Northampton, which is also a historical low-lying area. And I am concerned about flood risks to every neighborhood that could possibly be 
affected by some poor planning decisions ahead of time. And I know you're being very careful about what you um, permit and what you don't permit. I do want to say that um, there is a building that is uh, has been approved that is behind where I live on the corner of Finn and, Stra- and State that is in the process of being built by, I believe, Mr. Hansel. And it has been recently, I'm sure, inundated with all the water every every one of us has had. Um, but I have observed it being drained into the city sewer as I've driven down State Street. And that is a concern because I believe we're not allowed to do that. Certainly we have some pumps um, throughout our neighborhood and we're very careful to make that not happen. I just wanted to share that as, as a concern and thank you for listening. Thank you. Anyone else who hasn't spoken before? And I'll go back and ask uh, uh, for brief comments, please. Uh, Jackie Balance. Oh, first, uh, I I see uh, <laughs> there you. was one other person oh. who hadn't spoken yet. So, so go go ahead. But uh, I can I'll wait. get back to Jacqueline. I can wait. Okay, Jacqueline. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for uh, taking my comment. My name is Jacqueline McCraner. I live in Northampton. Um, I live on North Street, which is also um, a low lying area in town, has a very high water table. Um, I support my neighbors in Florence who have concerns about the relatively small square footage of the buffer zone in in proportion to the relatively large square footage of the um, proposed impermeable surface. And I'm just curious, as we experience substantially more rainfall with climate change, I wonder how the city is going to monitor and determine the very likely um, expanding boundary lines of wetlands, bordering vegetative wetlands and buffer zones going forward. So thank you. Thank you. Um, What I can say is that each project uh, requires uh, a delineation of where the current uh, boundaries are for jurisdictional areas, and uh, we don't have the ability or the uh, the technology with which to predict uh, future years. Uh, so we we have to evaluate what's what's in place at the time when the application comes before us. Uh, now to Jackie Ballance. Mm, thank you. Um, number one, I can I'll say that. The part where you have to water the those plantings in the back of the property to keep them alive, for, you have to keep well, water them. You have to keep them alive for a few years. And I know that Hansel planted saplings in front of his, one of the first houses he built on Warner Street. I live on Warner Street. Um, the people who bought the property didn't take care of the saplings, and and one of one little maple tree died. At the other end of my block, where there were more Hansel houses, he didn't deal with the slopes and the runoff water. And one house there has terrible water accumulation at the foot of the driveway, which melts in the daytime and freezes at night. And the owner has slipped and fallen. Oh, it's it's been a nightmare. Um, my own front yard is we're, a road. We're trying now. to evaluate. We're trying to evaluate the project that's proposed before. Okay, us today. I'm, I'm just saying this man has a track record. And that we're should... trying to evaluate the project that's okay. before us today. I read the ri- original uh, notice of intent application that was posted on Monday, and it said that the parcel was not within a floodplain according to a flood insurance rate map that was dated 1978. When I looked at the um, notice of intent application today, it's been changed. Uh, it's been using a flood insurance rate map dated 2013 for Hamden County, not for Hampshire County. So I think this um, notice of intent application at at tap dance needs to be looked at because we don't want to use a flood insurance rate dated 1978, nor do we want to use a flood map for Hamden County. 1978 is the is the official floodplain map for Hampshire County. It has not been updated since then. I'm talking about the notice of intent application from this, from this, yeah, from the application. But, but I, I'm just pointing out that there is no more updated floodplain map than that. This is not within a mapped floodplain. That, that's correct. 
Well, he does reference something from, it doesn't reference that one anymore. It references a FEMA flood insurance rate map dated 2013 for Hamden County. That's what's on the applicant's application. Hamden County flood map. Thank you. Um, and uh, Joe M. Yeah, I'm not too sure this is under your jurisdiction, but something that Diane said about the fact that they wanted natural gas, and I know that there is a moratorium on natural gas in Massachusetts, nobody can get any hookups. But I also know that the state is pushing for net zero in emissions, and they're pushing a lot of the like the mini duck splits and all that. Would that be under your jurisdiction as a requirement for the wetlands and the air environment as well? Because, you know, it has all that. That, that's play. not that, that's not how the wetlands act or the city ordinance is is written okay i was just kind of question because i know that a lot of towns in the eastern part are going that way and i just was wondering i don't know too much on here but thank you good time and deborah again yeah hi thank you i just want to um I, I was just so taken aback by the person who was um backing on to the on Aldrich or something backing onto the State Street project describing the um, water from the foundation being pumped into the city because the same thing happened on Warner Street I actually took pictures of it uh, there the water was being pumped from the building foundations into the um, sewer uh, on the street for a long time and so um, I just say this again, because there, this this builder has a significant track record of the same things happening. So this is something that you can actually do something about, um, because there's been definitely some, um, you know, apologizing at not even apologizing. It's like, you know, better to whatever to beg forgiveness or so. Um, so given the fact that that we were not the only one, I thought at the time, this is so crazy, it can't happen anywhere else. But to hear that now two years later or more, and there's been many houses in between, uh, this is a concern. Good, thank you. And anyone else? I, I just note, Kevin, if anyone does see a connection to a, a city storm drain that's known as an illicit connection, and they should absolutely contact the Department of Public Works about that. Chairman, I'd like to make a few clarifying comments when there's an opportunity. Uh, sure, we have not closed the hearing yet. Go ahead. Um, so I just want to reiterate that um, this project, this is geared towards the abutting concerns. This project is not required to provide stormwater management standards. I totally understand the issue, the concerns with flooding. It's a townwide, multi-town, multi-state issue as of recently, as I'm sure we're all aware. Um, however, you know, so when I did the survey on the street, looking at mapping, um, a lot of these abutting concerned properties, they have disturbances maintaining well within the 35-foot buffer. Um, you know, perhaps there's me measures they can take on their own property to mitigate their flooding and stormwater issues. Um, I, I just see it as very hypocritical to, you know, Focus. Let's not let's not characterize. Uh, I, 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 that's why I tried to interrupt and not have yep. uh, past record of a builder. Uh, that's not relevant for us in for considering this issue. And I would not want to see characterized anybody else's comments as uh, hypocritical or otherwise. I think people are doing the best they can to uh, 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 address concerns that they uh, take seriously and feel are important. And um, that's. Our job is to to listen and take some of those things into account as we then move forward on our decision. Um, I, I I would ask, in part, uh, prompted by the uh, some of the questions that have come up so far from the public, uh, we talked about uh, full basements with sump pump. Um, uh, where would the sump pump exit? Where where would the water be pumped? Those would discharge at the western rear of the property near the mitigation area would be the lowest point. So at the lowest point, which would be into the western uh, uh, area, uh, uh, the, the buffer zone just above the, the wetland? 
Correct. And I'll ask it technically, Sarah, is is that uh, a a jurisdictional issue um, that if there's additional water being uh, pumped rather than just uh, sheet flow uh, naturally occurring, um, is that something that uh, we should be uh, considering as uh, uh, influencing or impacting the wetland? Uh, yeah, and that's something the commission might want to request additional information about because you, you don't have possible volumes. Uh, you don't know if there's any erosion potential. So th that would deserve some additional discussion for sure. I, uh, I appreciate that. Yes, that, those were my thoughts. Um, it was also uh, uh, the, the question of, uh, it looked on the, on the map um, and we're only looking at the site itself. Um, that it's a relatively flat, you know, half a foot or a foot, um, and a little bit lower toward the west, uh, but uh, was not clear what happens to the uh, to, to the east. Is it uh, a, a constant elevation? I, I I I didn't see the topo lines going to the road uh, and across. Uh, yes, yeah, so it's relatively around two twenty four, the same elevation road is slightly crowned um there's there'd be no more contributing area to the road than probably what exists today it's so minute we're talking you know one to three inch differences okay um and i saw uh, one more uh public comment i see now celeste hey Yes, I just wanted to quickly clarify because I'm not sure if that comment was directed towards me or not. Um, but looking at the site plan, I don't believe that any of the property, at least my abutting property, is located within the 35 foot buffer. So I guess I was just seeking a little bit of clarity about that. Um, okay, no, to, that was... to the north, there's no uh, jurisdictional area there. Right. Okay. Thank you. So ready to close up, um, Ms. Epic again, please briefly. Yeah, hi, sorry. Um, you're welcome to come look at my backyard because there's a like 15, 10, 15 foot drop uh, in, in the elevation. So happy to help if I can. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, and and Kevin, if the commission is, is considering uh, requesting additional information from the applicant, um, such as shifting the the garages or um, getting some additional information about the, the sump pump discharge, you wouldn't want to close the hearing at this point. Right. We would want to continue the hearing um, rather than close it. Uh, and that would be, I want to poll my fellow and sister commissioners about what do you think? Uh, my inclination would be to say, okay, we, we got to get a little more information uh, I uh, of, of two sorts. One is, uh, I would ask the applicant how uh, far toward the road could the driveways be moved, the uh, garages be moved uh, to uh, provide for a, a larger uh, protected zone um, and to minimize the impervious surfaces of the driveway. Um, so that would be one thing I'd ask the applicant to come back by and to how uh, to, uh, what, what would be realistic on the applicant's part uh, to install more mature uh, trees and vegetation? Because I also had the thought uh, when I read this that, yeah, there's a relatively small number, like half dozen trees and the rest are um, uh, shrubs of various kinds. Um, and could there, for transpiration purposes, could there be uh, larger um, trees? Uh, and could those in be if we increase the uh, protected zone by 10, 15 feet um, throughout the whole area, uh, that those uh, trees would be in that area as well as the initial 35 uh, foot zone shown. Um, but then also, yes, uh, uh, more information about the probable uh, volume um, of uh, uh, the, uh, the pumped water coming out of groundwater. If there are some pumps to keep 
I mean, it seems to be a consensus that the water level is uh, very close to the surface there. So there's going to be uh, um, water getting into these basements. So the pump will be active. Where is that going to go? What's the likely volume? Those are all kinds of questions that I would want to see before I would feel ready um, to make an assessment here. So uh, having said my piece, I uh, wonder from uh, the other commissioners, uh, whether you have additional things you'd like to have um, thought through and whether you agree that continuing at this point is uh, a good idea. I think I think that makes sense. I agree with everything you said. The other piece that I would like to see more information on is a, around invasive species management and what the plan would be there for establishing the native plants and ensuring we don't have more um, invasive species. I agree. There would... Uh, we often have uh, an, an, a, a management plan that will go with the deed, um, so future owners are bound to sustain that protected zone and, and uh, the, the coverage of the uh, plantings um, in those zones. So those would be things that we would uh, normally consider doing, and so that could be uh, added. Uh, Mason, David, other thoughts? Uh, I, I agree, too, with everything it said. I'm especially concerned about the pervious surfaces and to what extent uh, is it possible to keep the same function but reduce the uh, impervious surface. I'm just glad the site is so flat. It was more of a grade. I think there would be a horrendous problem. Well, I think this was before somebody built Landy Avenue long ago. This was one continuous wetland. Um, so, uh, yeah. all right. Uh, so, yes, I'd uh, like I'd like to see it continue and have the question answered. You'd like to see what, Mason? I'd I'd like to see it continue so you can get those questions answered. I agree, and I I would add. Uh, also to that, the uh, a little more detail um, uh, about uh, possible slopes. I know on the other side of the road, um, there may be a change in topography, but uh, and but within the, the reasonable um, expected uh, sheet flow area surrounding both on this property and its immediate surrounds, uh, what's the topography of that to see where there's likely to be um, water movement. Um, so I, uh, I I know this is recorded and Sarah keeps notes the whole time. And so I, I imagine the applicant has been listening and hopefully absorbing this. But uh, uh, if, uh, if asked for, we'll uh, provide you with that list of things we'd like you to come back with more information about. Um, but for now, I think I'll ask if there's a motion to continue. Uh, and just before the motion, I think we would want to make sure that um... The applicant agrees to the continuation because there there is a timeline that the commission's obligated uh, to act under. Um, and if the next meeting May 9th would would make sense, and if that's yeah. enough time to provide that. Yes, we agree to that, and we'll make those changes with a revised plan. Okay, uh, and I'd suggest five thirty five as a time on May 9th uh, for the motion. Uh, don't we have already a five thirty case on, the, on that date? We do. It's that. Uh, it's the well, <laughs> uh, which will probably be continued again or withdrawn. But okay, understood. Um, all right. So, uh, someone want to make a motion uh, to continue this case to uh, the next meeting at five thirty five? So moved. And a second. A second. And Beth seconds. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor, roll call, Sarah? Uh, Beth? Yes. David? Yes. Mason? Yes. And Kevin? Yes. Thank you, unanimous, thank you. And I would thank everyone, both the applicant and the members of the public. Um, we did a site visit and walked around um, this location, but there's things that in 45 minutes or so of doing that, we're not gonna be able to understand as well as people who are more familiar with the area. So thank you for your input. All right. Um, and uh, is there any other business before the commission tonight? We if can talk not, about uh, yesterday. 
Right. We could continue our discussion a little bit about the Smith Dam. Um, uh, um, on, on the other hand, it's uh, going on seven o'clock, so that's a reasonable time to uh, to call it an evening. Um, yeah. So let's let's hold on that, Mason. But okay. uh, I, I, I'd be interested to hear uh, more about the possibility of dam removal, um, since that's something that we know is environmentally a valuable and an important thing. Um, and yet Paradise Pond is an iconic feature in yeah. Northampton, which um, not an easy thing to imagine disappearing. So, and as I say, I didn't know it had been around since the 1600s. So there, there was a dam there 350 years ago. So that was news to me. I've only been around here 45 years. So uh, it's been there the whole time I have been. All right. Thanks everybody. Uh, motion to adjourn. So moved. And a second? No second. And I imagine we do not need a roll call if we adjourn, Sarah. That's right. All right. Thank you so much, everyone.